please join me in welcoming Atlanta native and the CTO and co-founder of Solazyme, Harrison Dillon, to the TEDx Atlanta stage. So the, the, the value and in the, in the way any technology is judged uh, is really according to the range and the depth of the problems that it solves. And few problems are bigger in our world than the challenge of delivering fuel and the challenge of delivering food to our society. I started a company that makes oil through a renewable process, and we attack both of these problems. So what's bad about oil? Uh, we all know a lot of this. It's environmentally destructive to pull oil out of the ground. And we have to go deeper and deeper to get more oil, and we have to process heavier things like tar sands. And then there are spills, and we also fight wars over oil. We prop up dictators to get our hands on oil. We all know there are a lot of problems around oil. In fact, we in America consume 25% of all of the petroleum that's produced every year, and we have 3% of the reserves in our country worldwide. That's a, a definition of an unsustainable situation, and it causes major energy security concerns. In fact, two-thirds of our petroleum is imported, and one-fifth of all of the oil that we buy and import comes from dangerous and unstable countries, according to the State Department. So if you do the math, we're sending over $100 billion a year in cash directly to countries and people who don't like us very much. So why do we have oil? Why are we so surrounded by this as a society? Well, there are good things about oil. It's an extremely energy-dense material. In fact, by unit volume, so per gallon, and by unit weight, per pound, it has a lot of energy in it. And, and we've discovered this and developed it over the last 150 years to become the society we are. And it's also extremely versatile. Oil goes into many, many products that you buy. In fact, you probably touched oil-based products 50 times, if not 100, today before you came into this room. So we have an oil-based society, and it's a fact, and we can't change that overnight. So what do we do about it? Well, what if you could get the bad without the good? That, that's what we do. So 21 years ago to the month, I was a freshman at Emory right across town, and right across the freshman hall was a guy named Jonathan Wolfson. And we became really good friends immediately. And we started uh, talking about how maybe we'd start a company together someday. And we took backpacking trips and road trips. And, and we spent time talking about things. And I, I love biotechnology. I love genetics. Uh, and, and I wanted it to be a biotech company. So after college, I went to grad school to do my PhD in genetics. And I was working on human genetics. And about halfway through, uh, I realized that I was going on a path to join the pharmaceutical industry, and it didn't excite me. I didn't want to get on and extend that ride any longer. I wanted to do something really pioneering, and I started reading the scientific literature about microorganisms that make stuff that's flammable. And I thought, if you could use all this genetics and biotechnology to make organisms make stuff that burns efficiently, maybe you could make renewable fuel. And I called Jonathan. This was in the mid-90s, 94, and I said, I know what our company's going to be. We're, we're going to use microalgae to make fuel. And he said, that's delusional. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and we spent nine years talking about it, and, and I finished my PhD, and I went off to law school and became a biotech patent attorney, and, and I moved to Silicon Valley, and Jonathan went to law school and business school, and he started a software company, and we seasoned ourselves. And we became competent, uh, unlike, you know, sophomores in college on the ski lift, and, and became really, really interested in this idea. And in 2003, after nine years of talking about it, we decided that the technology was ready, and it was time to do this. So he sold his car, or sorry, he bought a car for $600 off the internet uh, with duct tape on the side of it, and drove from New York to Palo Alto, moved into my cottage, lived on the couch with my dog, and we started the company in our garage. And we went out to raise money, and we went all over the place, every venture capitalist who would let us in the door, and they said, we have no idea what you're talking about. This is delusional. 
We, we didn't ever even heard of biofuels. We couldn't find a venture capitalist in 2003 that had heard of the concept of biofuels. And so we got some funding from some angel investors and moved into a tiny lab and thought, all right, let's take on the world. Let's make diesel fuel. That was the whole mission. And so how we decided to do it was to use microalgae. These are unicellular algae. They're the, the precursors to higher plants. So they make oil as a way to store energy. And they do it by harvesting sunlight and turning that into sugar. And then inside the cell, they turn the sugar into oil and we grew big ponds of it. And we came to a horrible realization after two years of that that it costs over $1,000 a gallon to make oil from algae when you grow it in a pond. And we thought, wow, we better come up with a plan B. But what we noticed is they were very good at turning sugar into oil. And we also noticed that it costs $1.50 a gallon to turn sugar into ethanol using yeast. And we reasoned if we just substituted algae for yeast to make oil instead of ethanol, we could get into that low single digit per gallon cost range. So instead of taking millions of years to fossilize algae and plant material, we make oil in the matter of a few days by feeding sugars and biomass to algae in big steel tanks like what you see at a brew pub except 100 times bigger, and they convert it into crude oil. So this is how it works. You have all this plant material. You have cellulose, wood chips, sugar cane, uh, all the things that the earth makes. And we feed it to algae. We put it in a tank. Uh, and the, the algae eats the sugar and converts it into crude oil. And this was another big epiphany. Once we had the crude oil, we realized, why just make diesel fuel? Why not make jet fuel and lubricants and plastics and polyester and high nutrition edible oils and soap and cosmetics? We have an oil-based society, and it fundamentally changed the mission of our company. And we also knew we needed more money to accommodate that vision, so we raised more money. I'm going to show you a short video to, to show you uh, a little more detail on how the technology works. What we've done is take a variety of different feedstocks and we feed sugar sources such as cellulosic materials, switchgrass, wood chips, sugar cane, and it's a thousand times more productive to make oil from algae by feeding those sugar sources than by feeding light to the algae. And this brings down the cost of making the fuel dramatically. And then we take that crude oil and we convert it into diesel fuel jet fuel, heart healthy, high nutrition edible oils, personal care materials, anything that uses oil we can make with our technology. We want to do it in a way that doesn't compete with food, so we want to use non-food feedstocks, and we can convert all of this non-food material into both food and fuel. This fermentation facility allows us to use our process to make hundreds of thousands of gallons of renewable oil. To be able to grow an algae to the cell masses that they grow it, and those cell masses produce that quantity of oil per individual algae cell was just phenomenal. Our process starts with a frozen vial of algae engineered to make the perfect oil for our product. It goes into a flask and then into bigger and bigger containers until we have a fermenter that's several stories high that's capable of making thousands of gallons of algae. Our success at producing oil at this fermentation facility has proven that our process is scalable and can reduce the cost of making oil in existing fermentation facilities. The oil that we're making in this process can be turned into U.S. military-grade diesel fuel and jet fuel. We can make, through a renewable, domestic, secure process, drop-in hydrocarbon fuel. These fuels can go into standard military platforms, jets, land vehicles, and ships. This technology represents a major step forward in U.S. national energy security. This refinery has just processed our oil into jet fuel and diesel fuel. It plugs right into the refining and distribution and consumption infrastructure that already exists. We're just doing a final quality check before loading it up into the truck and sending it to the Navy. It's going right into the Navy's testing process. I'm just astonished that y'all can do that, you know. 30 years ago, nobody would have ever dreamed that this was possible. They, they might not have thought of 
it was possible 10 years ago, you know? Oh, yeah, you're <laughs> you know? exactly right. I mean, this is really... We're about to deliver a little bit less than 22,000 gallons of finished fuel from this project, all made here at this refinery. So you heard me mention uh, the military a few times in there. Um, we have a major project right now with the U.S. Navy who has a goal to take entire bases off of petroleum and put them onto domestically produced renewable fuel. So that's, that's a big ongoing project. But we don't just want to sell to the military. We want to sell to everybody. And we want this to get really, really big. And we have to ask ourselves, how big can this be? And we have to keep asking this because we keep discovering it can be bigger than we thought it was going to be again and again. And forget about diesel fuel for a second or jet fuel. Think about cooking oil. A big proportion of the world population gets a lot of its daily caloric intake from cooking oil. And those oils are getting scarcer and scarcer. Well, what we can do is take something like sugarcane that grows really well in places like Africa and Asia but has very little nutritional value, and we can convert it into high-nutrition edible oils, and we can feed people who before really didn't have what they needed. So when you look and you think, well, okay, well, how big is, could this really be? This is, this is a pie chart of global arable land, and you can see that 87% of global arable land is making carbohydrates, so that's sugarcane and root starches and cereal starches, and only 13% is making oil crops like soybean and canola. And you can't just expand that 13% to get more oil because farmers have to grow what grows well. And what our technology represents is the first viable bridge to convert what the earth likes to make into what runs our society, which is oil. But what about non-arable land? What about not competing with food? Well, what about wood chips and sugar and, uh, and uh, sawdust and the grass clippings from golf courses that just get landfilled and turned into methane? What about the yard waste that gets taken away you know, once a week from your, your house? Well, if, if you took all the cellulose, just the, the non-food plant material, that's produced in America today, that's 1.3 billion tons, and if you converted it through my company's process into crude oil, we would make over 65 billion gallons of crude oil per year. That's about 22% of total U.S. oil consumption, which, by the way, is about the amount that we import from dangerous and unstable countries. It can get very big. We went, though, to get a reality check. We went to Houston. And we talked to the big oil companies who, you know, I think they looked at us like we were ants the first time we walked in there and, and said, look, here's what we can do. And we can make these perfect molecules and they can be cheap and they'll, they'll be renewable fuels. And they said, we don't really care if you think you can make the perfect molecule. We have 100 years of experience at turning hydrocarbon A into hydrocarbon B. And we don't really care if you say that you can make it at the right cost. We're good at bringing the cost down. Tell us and show us that you can scale it. Because if you can't scale energy technology, you have no chance. So that's what we've been focusing on for the last few years. We were the first company to actually make renewable fuels and actually deliver them to the military. We've been scaling this and running this process at commercial scale for almost three years. So what's the big, big picture of all of this? I've done a lot of thinking about that because I've had to recalibrate my thinking again and again. How big could we really make this? There's a concept called carrying capacity in biology, and it's how much population can a closed biological system support. And by the way, the Earth is a closed biological system. And it can go up, and it can also go down. And sustainability matters. And about two years ago, in the height of the financial crisis, the worst recession since the Great Depression. Everything was falling apart. It was the fall of 2008. And I was thinking to myself, how did we get here? How, how, did, we, how did we consume so much more than we produced? And how, do, how is our financial system crashing? And what, what's the lesson here to learn? And I started thinking about history and some of the things I had learned. And one thing I, I remembered is it took me back to what happened in 1971 when Richard Nixon unilaterally ended the convertibility of dollars into gold, ended the Bretton Woods Agreement, and he did it solely for U.S. financial advantage. And we've been riding that ever since. And another thing that happened in 71 is we hit peak oil in this country. And after that, we went down a path of 
fighting wars and propping up dictators to get oil. And another thing that happened in 71 is I was born. <laughs> and it made me think to myself, has my entire lifespan and all of the education and all the opportunities I've had, has that all been the product of U.S. ingenuity at extending the ride beyond what we were really entitled to, to have? And, and it, it, it is, are we at the point now in, in the fall of 08 where everything's crashing, where no amount of credit default swaps and mortgage-backed securities and tomahawk missiles and all of the tools that we use to extend our ride, are we now at the absolute final end? And if we are, what are we going to do about it and who's going to do something about it? Who are those people? And I realized that I'm one of those people and I'm doing exactly what I ought to be doing and I need to get the message of where we need to go and enroll people in how to be a sustainable society and think about the problems that we solve. Energy time is measured in 10-year increments. It takes a decade to conceive and plan and design and finance and permit and construct and get operational a major energy project. According to the U.S. Constitution, we have two-year political cycles. So there are five increments of political time for every increment of energy time. And if you want the single biggest reason why this country does not have a comprehensive energy policy, that's it. So we all have to do something about this, and we're all in this together. And when you ask the question, well, did the financial crisis two years ago signal the, the sunset of, of America's economic ride? Are we going to be like the Roman Empire? The answer is nothing has to be that way. History doesn't have to repeat itself. We all are in this together. And you don't have to start a company in your garage. And you don't have to spend all of your 20s in school to make a difference and to do something. But what we all have to do is we have to recognize that we consume more than we produce. And, and we have to care about where the raw materials come from that go into the products that we buy as consumers. And we have to care enough to notice that the companies that make those products care about where those raw materials come from and what the impacts are. And we have to care about making sure that our politicians understand that we care about more than just what happens in the next political cycle and that they focus on solving real problems and not quick political gains. And there are no quick fixes and there frankly just isn't a free lunch. And I think really what it comes down to is, is most people really, do we all want a free ride? I mean, would we all want just a completely free ride? I don't think so, because I think a completely free ride, it's the kind of thing that does bring down an empire. So we are all in this together, and we, I think, have enough ingenuity and enough creativity as a society to come up with sustainable ways of doing things. Thank you very much.